Hello everyone, we are still talking about love and how the heart ticks. So, uh, this is the third section of, uh, of uh, my lecture, Heart, the Embryological Origin and I am Sanan Rahman. We are talking about the cardiac loop formation. In this we will uh, discuss how the heart tube which has initially been formed will elongate upon itself and how it loops and twists around each, um, each other to form the adult heart. We'll also see the clinical correlates of uh, this section uh, and that what happens if this heart looping does not take place or if there is a problem with the process of elongation or looping of the heart. So first we have the elongation of heart tube. Before we get into it, let's take a look on the figure. What do we have here? So this is the caudal end, this is the cranial end of the heart tube. The caudal end consists of the sinus venosis, this is the primitive atrium, the primitive ventricle, the bulbous cordis and the truncus arteriosus. This portion, the bulbous cordis and the truncus arteriosus forms the helps in the formation of the outflow tract. The ventricles, uh, the ventricle helps in the formation of ventricles, a part of the bulbous cordis also forms the ventricles. The atriums mature into adult atrium and sinus venosus we will see how the inferior, superior inferior vena cava are formed by these. This is how the bending actually takes place. This is how an elongated heart tube bends upon each other or loops upon itself to form the adult heart. So let's just talk about it. So we have elongation um, via cells from the secondary heart field. So secondary heart field was initially lying in the splanchnic layer of the lateral plate mesoderm which was ventral to the uh, pharynx. Now uh, it participates or it gives off cells that help in the elongation of the heart tube. This process is essential for, uh, for the formation of portion of the right ventricle and outflow tracts and for the looping process. We talked about this before, so the secondary heart field is responsible for the formation of a part of right ventricle and the outflow tracts. So if it is inhibited, what would happen? there would be double outlet from the right ventricle that both the outlets of the aorta as well as the pulmonary um, artery would lie in the um, ven right ventricle. We can have uh, ventricular septal defects, uh, we can have phallostetrology, we can have pulmonary atresia or pulmonary stenosis. We'll be taking them up shortly so I'm not going to go into the detail of these right here. So the process of cardiac looping. So here you can see the simple heart tube again. Uh, this is the sinus venosus, this is the caudal end, this is the cranial end, this is the 22nd day of development. So we have um, the sinus venosus in somewhat darker green. Then we have atrium, this light green. Then we have the atrioventricular canal. This is <coughs> the communication between the atrium and the ventricle. Now we have ventricle in this uh, blue. Then we have bulbous cordis in yellow and then truncus arteriosus. This might be blue or turquoise, whatever you want to consider it. So after this, we move on to the 23rd day. Now you can see the looping, the process of looping has started. Then the process of looping, it tends to loop and twist upon itself to form the adult heart. Now let's see how that happens. Sorry. Uh, it begins on the 23rd day of development. So 23rd day of development is here. The cephalic portion, so this is the cephalic portion, it tends to bend ventrally, caudally and to the right. Here you can see it's bending uh, to the right and uh, caudally and this is the ventral bending of the tube. Now the caudal portion, this is the caudal portion, the portion where sinus venosus and the atrium lie, <laughs> they tend to bend dorsocranially towards the dorsum and the cranium and to the left. So this is the direction of bending of the tube. You can clearly see that in the figure. So this results in the formation of this tube. So we'll see what happens. <coughs> this bending, which may be due to cell shape changes, it helps in the formation of cardiac loops. 
and what allows these cell shape changes this is the cardiac jelly that allows these cell shape changes what was cardiac jelly cardiac jelly was extracellular matrix which was secreted by the cardiac myoblast <coughs> which lied in the um, second layer of the heart this cardiac jelly was rich in hyaluronic acid and helped in the shape changes during the process of cardiac looping so it is usually complete by the 28th day so what um, happens so uh, at the end of the process of looping we have two atria the right and the left atria we have a primitive left ventricle which is formed by the ventricular portion of the tube then we have this um, a developing right ventricle and the conus cordis the developing right ventricle forms a part of the right ventricle and this is the cord conus cordis which forms the part of the uh, outflow tracks this is what the bulbous cordis gives rise to and finally we have the aortic sacs and the aortic arches which the truncus arteriosus gives rise to then <coughs> so we talked about this before um, in the heart tube the local expansions begin to take place initially the heart tube was very simple like this a simple elongated tube but now local expansions begin to take place so atrial portion forms the common atrium <laughs> this is the atrial portion this forms the common atrium this common atrium um, this common atrium is now incorporated within the pericardial cavity the atrioventricular junction uh, it can it's not visible in this figure because of the looping process but the atrioventricular junction is the place or the junction between the atria and the ventricle it remains narrow and it forms the atrioventricular canal so the canal connects the atrium to the early embryonic ventricle this is the ventricle and it's uh, the uh, av canal the atrioventricular canal connects these atria to the or the common atrium to the ventricle so bulbous cordis is narrow so this portion is the bulbous cordis it is narrow in general however it is expanded in its distal uh, except for its proximal third where it, it has been expanded now it forms a part of the trabeculated portion of the right ventricle here you can see it is forming the part of the right ventricle which is being uh, which is under development at the moment Trabecular projections which lie within the myocardium of the heart, they can only be visualized from the inside, so they cannot be visualized in the figure. So the process of cardiac looping is continuing at this portion. The mid portion, the conus cordis, it forms the outflow tracks of both the ventricles. So this portion, the portion in green is bulbous cordis and the upper portion in green which is adjacent to the black portion this portion is the mid portion or the conus cordis it helps in the formation of the outflow tracts of both the ventricles <coughs> the distal part of the bulbus which is the um, truncus arteriosus now forms the uh, proximal portion of aorta these are the aortic and the pulmonary artery these are the roots of it and this in black is uh, the distal portion of the bulbous cordis which is known as the truncus arteriosus it forms the root and the proximal portion of the aorta and the pulmonary artery the junction between the ventricles and the bulbous cordis this is the junction between the ventricles and the bulbous cordis it remains narrow and it forms a primary interventricular foramen so since the bulbous cordis gives rise to part of the right ventricle so junction between the um, bulbous cordis and the primitive ventricles it uh, remains narrow and forms the primary interventricular foramen now what happens proximal and distal to the primary interventricular foramen which is supposed to lie in this area this area um, so proximal and distal to it this is the proximal portion this is a distal portion uh, primitive trabeculae are beginning to form trabeculae projections which can only be visualized on the inside of the heart so it cannot be visualized here the primitive ventricle now trabeculated form this is the primitive ventricle which is now trabeculated that it has projections in it on its insides now it forms the primitive left ventricle so primitive left ventricle has been formed 
the trabeculated portion of the proximal third of the bulbous cordis is now the primitive right ventricle so the primitive ventricle when it undergoes trabeculation it forms the left ventricle the primitive left ventricle the bulbous cordis the proximal part of it when it undergoes trabeculation it forms the trabeculated portion of the right ventricle primitive right ventricle so now let's talk about the clinical correlates of what happens if the process of this elongation and looping does not take place as it is supposed to be so in this figure you can see this is a normal child with a normal heart and in this child the heart, the position of the heart has been reversed to the right this condition is known as dextrocardia so on dextrocardia the heart lies on the right side of the thorax it occurs when the heart loops to the left instead of the right so the looping of heart which is supposed to be in on the right side now it happens on the left side and the result is dextrocardia it may also be introdu uh, induced during gastrulation when the laterality of the embryo is being established that is the axis of the embryo was not established correctly and the heart uh, was developed on the opposite side due to this defect so it can also occur during <coughs> cardiac looping as mentioned before that it gives rise to um, the process of cardiac looping was supposed to go uh, uh, right on the right side but it went to the left side and it resulted in dextrocardia so dextrocardia can also have some associations let's see what are those associations so there are two types of associations in dextrocardia the complete situs inverses and the laterality sequence <laughs> so let's talk about the complete situs inverses is in complete situs inverses we see all organs of uh, the thoracic and the abdominal region almost all organs are completely reversed the, like there is complete reversal of symmetry in all organs here you can see in the figure this is situs inverses the liver lies on the right uh, on the left side um, when it's supposed to lie on the right side the spleen and the stomach they uh, lie on the left side when they're supposed to lie on the opposite side so uh, you it can it is clearly visible that um, all the organs have shifted their symmetry according to the heart in laterality sequence only a few of the organs may shift their sequence along with the heart that is not all of the organs may shift their origin along with the heart so these were the two associations that are usually present with dextrocardia dextrocardia constitutes a very important clinical case as the apex speed lies in the opposite direction uh, and um, it can be a part of your talks as well as your clinical examination so this was all about the process of cardiac looping in this section we talked about how the heart tube loops upon itself to form the adult heart what structures give rise to uh, what structures in the adult heart the role of this cardiac jelly how it helps in the metamorphosis and how the adult atria the uh, the how the common atria the primitive left ventricle the primitive right ventricle the roots of the pulmonary and the um, aortic uh, outlets are being formed uh, then we talked about a defect in the process of looping uh, which was dextrocardia and its association with the situs inverses and the laterality sequence i hope you found it interesting for further sections keep watching scardia.com